My remote people may not be able to do this without me just walking everybody through the lab. Um, so, we want the controls to be people who use the cafeteria regularly. We may want to match students and students and staff and staff. Um, we need them to have been around the time that, uh, that people got sick, right? We need them to have been potentially in the cafeteria around the time people got sick. Um, anything else? Janitors, cleaning staff? Well, I mean, we want staff, right? Staff and staff. Yeah. You don't want to pick something that's maybe going to miss something important. You don't want to pick just a certain aspect of staff if your six staff are kind of all over the map. You know, if your six staff all turned out to be teaching faculty, then you'd want your control staff to be teaching faculty. But here, the staff was kind of just everybody. So now we get to the next question. Um, now that we know what sorts of people we want on shoulders, how do we go about actually collecting the group? We actually need people. Do you pick the people that were mentioned in the previous question and ask them the same questions? What people? We don't have people. We just have we just have an idea of people, but we don't have an actual list of people. How do we get our list? We got our sick list, we got them. We just decided who we want as our controls. How do we get them? How do we get the survey tool? Okay, that is one way to do it, right? If we want people to use the cafeteria, one way to do it is to go and sit in the cafeteria. And then when people come in, you can go to your useless place regularly. They say no, you don't give them the survey. If they say yes, then you go, well, where, have you been here the last two weeks? And they go, yes, you give them the survey. That's not the only way to do this, though, right? Maybe you don't want to sit in the cafeteria all day. Email them all. Huh? Email them all. Yeah, some, this was the 60s, there wouldn't have been email, but, uh, <laughs> but there would have been records. You could have gone into the records and gotten a bunch of names also and gone from it that way. Especially if they have records of, of cafeteria usage, you could pick people out that way. But it turns out there's a, at some point, you need to actually have physical people to be your controls to match with your cases. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. Now, question three, I'm gonna, since I had to turn the microphone off because it uh, seems to have gone dead on me. Uh, I'm going to stand up here and repeat stuff that people say. So Hannah, read question three. And don't overthink it. In most cases, the list of potential control people is much larger than the list of cases. Why is that? Uh, because we have a higher population of students in comparison to the population that is sick? Yeah. It's very unusual to get an outbreak that's better than 50% of your population. There's almost always more not sick people than sick people when you're looking to set up a study like this. So we got lazy. On to the next page. We just got a list. Yeah. Yeah. You may miss some of that stuff. What did we decide on? Um, we could do it in the cafeteria. We could do it by going into the uh, the administrative records. Uh, you know, however you, you want to get, you got to get access to these people, and that's kind of what we were deciding. And now that we're on the next page, we went into the records, and out of a list from the school, we picked 29 staff and 71 students that we were going to send the survey to, along with the survey to our cases, our 31 cases. Why those two numbers? By 29 and 71. The numbers should look familiar. The staff to student ratio. It matches the ratios of students to staff. It matches the percentage numbers. <clears throat> we don't need to match one to one, but we, if we decide students and staff are important, we'll match proportion to proportion. And we got this survey that we were talking about. And we're gonna ask, you know, the stuff that you ask on a, a medical survey, age, gender, et cetera. One thing we want, we want a very detailed 
medical history of history of illnesses. Why? How so? That's it. No one's ever suggested that before. That we may find that of our big school population, that the only people who are sick also have some other issue, uh, which is possible. But as I said, nobody's ever brought it up before. Um, now, other conditions they have could be important in other ways too, right? Like dietary restrictions and stuff like that? Okay. Risk factors. Risk factors. Um, so say one of our cases has uh, diverticulitis. Are they a case still? Or did we just come up with a better explanation for why they were in the infirmary that day? Yeah. So we want to be able to exclude our cases if we've got a better explanation than this mystery disease for what may have sent them into the infirmary. What if one of our potential controls has a really nasty ulcer and they're taking all sorts of uh, drugs for their ulcer. They didn't get sick. Do we know they didn't get exposed though? They might have been protected from by uh, these drugs they were on. So there's a bunch of stuff we want to look at to decide who we maybe don't want on our list anymore. Also, did everybody who got sick go to the infirmary? Probably not. So we want to know what sort of issues they've had in the last two weeks, because there may be cases we don't know about, and we sure as heck don't want them in our controls. It turns out that doesn't wind up happening, but it's certainly something that was a possibility. On the survey, we go for a week. Did you eat at this meal? Okay, if you did, what did you eat? Here's the menu. Did you eat at this meal? If you did, what did you eat? Here's the list. And the first thing we're going to do is figure out what the risks are for each of the meals that was served. So get your little calculators out. Of the 52 people that had dinner on the 17th, 17 of them got sick. What's the attack rate for the dinner of the 17th? Seven of the 75 people that had lunch, 30 of them got sick. What's the attack rate? Where was Twelve out of 51. Fifteen out of 51. Eighteen out of 55. Three, three? Yeah. 11 out of 53? Say again? 21. 16 out of 51? 20 out of 60 is not, I don't need a calculator for that. 13 out of 52? 25. Okay, so this is the risk for people that showed up at a particular meal. Nothing really high, is there? There's one that's a little higher than the other ones, but it's not hugely higher. If this turns out to be a single meal, why don't we have a real high number here? Most people tend to skip breakfast and a lot of people will eat lunch. lunch. Actually, our sick people tend to not eat breakfast. You'll notice the risk for breakfast tends to be low on every day. And that tells us that this group, not big breakfast people. Maybe it's a food that's common between breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Actually, just the opposite. If there was overlap, we'd have a couple of high numbers, but we don't have any really high numbers. 
Like say, like say it is this meal. Why is that number way higher than 40%? Because the total number of people that ate lunch is higher than the other cases, or the other meals? That's the, uh, the, the great thing about an attack rate. You can compare big groups and little groups because it's all a proportionate risk. It's a percentage. But less than half of the people that, that went to lunch got sick. Why did the rest of the people get sick? No, no, these, this is the people who ate that meal, right? They didn't this is eat the, in the cafeteria? Yeah, they did, because that's what they told us. <laughs> Try, man. All right. Um. They didn't eat where? In the cafeteria. I know. You You've eaten in cafeterias, right? Right. You went with friends? Did everybody eat the same thing? No. Cafeterias have choices. Oh, no. So they could. You know, these other people that went but didn't get sick may not have picked whatever the heck made everybody sick. Here's why we need this column. If it was a, a, a food at a particular meal and you didn't show up for that meal, should you have gotten sick? No, she didn't show up for the meal. Of the 28 people who didn't come to lunch that day, we have one person sick. What's the attack rate there? So we're rounding everything off, so four. Now you're gonna fill the rest of the numbers out. You're not gonna get a jump anything like that. The risk for showing for that meal versus skipping the meal is 10 times higher. And you're not gonna get a jump like that for any of the other meals. So it's gonna look like this comes down to just lunch on the 17th, which is our next question which meal or meal seems to be the source of the illness. Lunch on the 17th. And here's the thing everybody forgets to do. I told you I'd warn you. Once we've got a potential meal, we want to go back to the curve we set up and put our candidate meal on the curve. Here's the middle of the 17th. We got 31 cases. It looks like 29 of them happened after lunch. That works, right? Except now we gotta explain, and now I'm on to the question on the bottom of the page. How do we, how do we explain these two people? If it was lunch, how do you explain two people that got sick before lunch ever happened? Okay, they could be sick with something else. These are pretty generic symptoms, right? Or they could have had an ingredient that was made in for that lunch previously. Possibly, but it had to have been an ingredient that nobody else really wanted earlier because we don't have particularly high attack rates for earlier meals. But it's possible, like, I don't know, say they had sliced tomatoes with the scrambled eggs for breakfast, and then they put the same sliced tomatoes in the sandwiches for lunch. Well, nobody's taking sliced tomatoes for scrambled eggs, except maybe two people. And then, but everybody's eating the sandwiches. It's not sliced tomatoes and stuff. I'm just making that up. Right. But, uh, yeah, it could be an earlier, but it would have to be an early ingredient that, that it wasn't really popular at another meal. Because if it was, we'd have a high attack rate for the other meal. Uh, any other possibility? Who might have had access to the food? Yeah, I'd be real curious as to whether these two people have access to the cafeteria at the, at the, you know, either work there or have friends who work there and maybe got access before lunch was served. But, you know, most of our cases are after lunch. This still works. If we had decided it was lunch on the 18th and half of our cases had already happened, we'd know we were looking at the wrong thing. That's why you go back and mark your curve. And people do forget to do it. We now have another clue. Everybody's gonna hate this. A real big clue to figuring out a uh, disease that you're working with 
is how long does it take to make you sick? Once you're exposed, how long before you get symptoms? That's your incubation period. We can start to figure that out. Lunch on this campus runs from 11 to 1. We're not really sure when everybody ate, so how do we fudge the difference? Yeah, we're going to decide just for ease that everybody got exposed at noon. Sometime during lunch, they got exposed. We're not sure exactly when we're averaging it out to noon. So we can figure out the incubation periods. When did the first person get sick? Can I, can I sneeze on you today and give you a cold last week? No. Anybody who got sick before lunch, we can't count for incubation oh, periods, yeah. right? So when did the first person get sick after lunch? Uh, 6.30 or 1 p.m. or something? Or 1 p.m. Well, on that particular day, it was 6.30. So how long did it take them to get sick? If, if we're using noon as our start point, six and a half hours. We want to average this group which means you have to figure out everybody's incubation period. So I have to go down and just write it next to there. It does, it, it takes a while. I told you we're gonna have it, you weren't gonna enjoy this. Now keep in mind, you've crossed a bunch of people off, so you're not gonna count those. You gotta keep track of the days and the AMs and PMs. Now right now, we're looking for the first question, which is the range. Our incubation range bottoms out at six and a half hours. What does it top out at? When did the last person get sick? 2 p.m. on the 19th. So how many hours was that after noon on the 17th? 70 something. Mm. I don't know. Well, how many days? Two. So how many hours is that? Four. And then another Five. two in the afternoon. How many more hours? <laughs> two, right? Right? So what's 48 and 2? Okay. So our range, and that's your next question, is from 6 and a half hours to 50 hours. And it is always useful to do an average because you never know what's an outlier. Somebody might have gotten sick way earlier than they were supposed to or way later than they were supposed to according to the rules of the disease. So you're gonna to wanna to figure out an average. So who can pick on those? Can we pick on anyone? I don't remember. I think we picked on Yeah, yeah, um, we're, yeah question uh, six. Some people expect the average to be right in the middle of the range. What, fact, what factors would keep this from being true? Uh, Skewness? Which one? I thought we were doing the period average right now. No, we did the range to start with. Right. And the average you're going to do on your own because it's going to take you forever to do. You've got to figure everybody's incubation period. No, I said I complained. This is really important. You're going to figure everybody's incubation period and divide by what? Did all 31 of our people get sick after lunch? No. no. Who did? So how many people? So there's 27. 29. So you're going to add up all your incubation periods and divide by 29 to get the average. And round it off. It's a fuzzy number. It's pointless to take it out to like tens or hundreds or anything. Round it off to the nearest hour. Make sure you label it as an hour, though. So the question we have right now is six and a half, 50. There's a number right in the middle. 
Yeah. Why is that not the average? What would keep it from being the average? Students. Hmm? Well, I'm just the outliers. Yes, yeah. outliers plus students. Well, along with. Um, so those are the people. Like if there's a lot of people on this side of the range. Ah, distribution, it? right? If a whole bunch of people got sick early, not very many people got sick late, that average is coming down. If a bunch of people got sick late, not too many people got sick early, that average is going up. So it's the distribution of cases in that range that's gonna move that average off of the midpoint. Now the reason that question is there is because way too many times I saw people go, I don't wanna figure out this average, I'm gonna figure out what's right between six and a half and 50, and that's gotta be the average, right? So this is just to keep you from doing that. The same way, okay, if, the, if, if an exam ran from like 40 at your lowest grade and 100 was your highest grade, well, right in between is 70, but the average isn't necessarily 70. If a bunch of people do well, your average is gonna be higher than that. If a bunch of people do poorly, the average is gonna be lower than that. Same thing happens here. 